Next speaker is Corey Marsh from the Southern California Seminary, which was founded by a guy named Tim LaHaye, <laughs> the college and then the seminary. And uh, he is the editor, along with his uh, fellow professor from there, of a new book uh, relating to dispensationalism. And so we had had these next three talks uh, are guys that had written in that book. And of course, so he's going to deliver his chapter from that book. Is that right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let her rip, Tater Chip. I want everybody to be able to read along while I'm uh, doing my stuffy, academic, snobby chapter so nobody gets lost. Well, as we're, as we're doing this, um, uh, there, my name is as been said, I'm Corey Marsh. I am associate professor of New Testament in, uh, in Southern California, at Southern California Seminary in the greater San Diego area. I also direct our publishing arm, SCS Press. And uh, there was a comment uh, made earlier, uh, Robbie Dean, you made a comment earlier, start kicking off the conference, that some of the presentations throughout this conference are academic, they're publishable, so they can be a little dry and uh, boring at times. So uh, that hasn't happened yet, and I really hope that doesn't happen with mine. I'm going to do my best to not be boring for you guys. But I am, I will admit proudly that uh, my chapter does fit within that academic, snobby, uh, publishable uh, paper. Uh, in fact, it actually is uh, published as well as three of the presentations following me after this. Um, uh, it's in a book that was mentioned just now called Discovering Dispensationalism. Hopefully the, the, the slide will come up. Uh, if not, you guys have a, there we go, thank you. Um, you guys have a postcard on your, uh, on your table, this guy right here. This is the book that we are, we've been working on for two years, over two years. And we had hoped to have it at you know, in the book tables behind us uh, and ready for today. But uh, one of the things you'll notice on the back, it says summer 2020. Uh, obviously, we're past the summer. And I just want to call attention to that, that uh, this, there has been a few issues in getting it actually released. And I don't want any confusion to happen from that. It's still going to be released probably uh, spring of next year or possibly summer of next year. There's been several issues that have happened over the last year uh, not least of which, of course, which has affected all of us, uh, COVID, right? COVID crisis. I'm in uh, California, as is my colleague, James Fazio, my co-editor. And uh, as you can imagine, if you know anything about uh, what we're dealing with in California, it's kind of become its own crazy country <laughs> right now throughout the last year with COVID. And it halted just about everything we were doing, not just at the seminary, uh, for instance, last night I had to teach a class. I had to leave the banquet a little bit earlier and uh, teach a hermeneutics class up in the hotel room because uh, my classes are now online for my students, which is actually very nice because we got to talk about the conference and all the wonderful things we've heard here so far. Um, but it also halted everything we do on the publishing uh, side. Uh, we have daily meetings for all the different publications we have at SES Press and page layouts and editing and all these types of things, and that kind of put a halt to everything. So although it's not out, which was supposed to be summer, uh, it is going to still be coming out. Um, so that has happened. A couple other things has happened as well. Uh, most unfortunately for us, personally, it was mentioned last night, Tommy, you brought it up during the banquet, uh, one of our esteemed cont uh, cont contributors, uh, con uh, contributors to the book who was going to be here today, uh, just recently passed, a few weeks before the conference. Dr. William Watson, I know many of you here are familiar with his work, uh, history professor at Colorado Christian University, a huge loss for a conservative Christian scholarship. Uh, Bill was going to present his paper after me, which is a chapter in the book. If you know anything about Dr. Watson, uh, he's an expert in 17th and 18th century uh, apocalyptic ideas as well as dispensational ideas. He published a wonderful book with Lampion Press, Dispensationalism Before Darby. Uh, but one of his passions also related to that was medieval thought 
and his chapter deals with dispensational ideas within the uh, late antiquity and early medieval periods, and it's a wonderful chapter. He was scheduled to be here right after, after me, and uh, I talked to him a few days before the conference, very sad. He was extremely excited. We just talked about booking our flights, and he was uh, really looking forward to being here with us and us with him. So obviously we are dedicating uh, not only the book to his memory, but of course uh, my particular talk um, and my colleague, Dr. Fazio, and we have three talks that are going to take us through the afternoon. After me, it is William Watson's chapter, which will be read by H. Wayne House, who um, it was, a, it was a close friend and publisher of him as well, so he will be reading Dr. Watson's chapter in his place. So we've had several things that have happened and a couple more other reasons uh, that have sort of put the uh, publication off uh, from summer 2020 uh, to what will be spring. Um, but not to worry, it certainly is coming out. And in the meantime, as you can see on the slides, uh, if anybody goes online, uh, you'll see the image here, you see the, the authors within our book, uh, we are offering a pre-trib conference discount. If you want to get online, you don't have to pay anything right now. All we want is your contact info. So your emails and stuff, and that's it. So throughout the conference, we'll probably have this. You can see it right there on, in the middle of the book page. Uh, enter pre-trib in the message box. Uh, you see the website there, SCS Press. Um, if you can't remember that, you can just, on the back of the card, very simple, SCS Press, you'll find not only this book and enter the pre-trib conference code, we'll get your information, and I'll follow up with you, one of us will, and make sure you get that discount. Um, so just go ahead on the website, and when you're there, you're going to see uh, several of our publications. Um, Here's the, the actual page, if you were to go on that SCS Press website, you'll see the book right here and uh, the outline of the book, uh, as well as right here, the message box. Just enter pre-trib, your name, your email. You don't even have to give us any money right now. We just want to gauge some interest and we'll follow up with you with a discount. So please do that. Uh, if you are interested, we'll have this discount available uh, for a short time, probably till the end of December. Come January, it, uh, it'll be gone. But uh, while you're there on SES Press website, you'll see several other books that we've published, and some of you are familiar with them. Some of you in the room have actually contributed some of our works. A couple years ago, for the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, we published a book called Forged from Reformation, and the, the subtitle is What Got Everybody, How Dispensational Thought Advances the Reformed Legacy. Uh, it's been reviewed several times since. It's got a, a sort of a, a nice uh, uh, long, uh, it's, it's gaining traction as it's happened. It was the only book that I'm aware of that was published for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, so this was 2017, uh, that was critical of some of the, uh, the ideas that came out down the, during the heroic uh, Reformation. With all the good that happened, there was also some bad. Uh, one particular chapter in there deals with Martin Luther and his rabid anti-Semitism and his Christocentric hermeneutic, his allegorical hermeneutic that sort of justified, uh, so the argument goes in the chapter, um, his hatred toward the Jews toward the end of his life. His last three publications before he died were uh, incredibly <laughs> awful. Um, so we try to be very charitable, but also prove the idea, demonstrate that out of the Reformation, a return to the original languages, a return to literal hermeneutics, came uh, in, so many, in so much time the dispensational system. We have other books as well. Um, George Gunn talked last night on the New Apostolic Reformation, NAR. Well, we had published a book called Defining Deception, Freeing the Church from the Mystical Miracle Movement, if you're familiar with that book, and you'll see it on the side if you go there, it was written by a very good friend of mine, Kosti Hinn. Um, if you, that last name sounds familiar, Hinn, he is the nephew of Benny Hinn. Um, and a, a wonderful, orthodox, dispensational Christian, by the way. Um, and he was a, a pastor of mine for a while when we published this book that's also authored with uh, Tony Wood. That is on there as well, and very well documented. There were some quotes that... Uh, that George has said last night from Michael Brown, 
uh, regarding grave soaking, or what's also called grave sucking. And uh, I had conversed with Michael Brown personally as an editor of that book, and uh, we got into some pretty heavy debates. But within the footnotes within that book um, is some of the research that's backed up uh, for that particular movement, the NAR. And coming from Costi Hinn, as you can imagine, he was an insider. Costi was uh, groomed to be the next Benny Hinn. In fact, you, st you still see him on those old Benny Hinn videos. He was the guy catching whoever fell, you know, whoever, caught, whoever Benny healed, Costi would catch. Well, in that book, he talks about, he exposes his family. He exposes how they manipulated miracles. Um, things like gold dust with NAR, he talks about that. Um, so he's, he's quite a target right now, not only as you can imagine with his family, but um, with, with critics or with fans of the whole uh, name it, claim it movement. So I would, I would encourage you to check out that book if you haven't. It's certainly our biggest seller to date. Uh, Forge from Reformation, as I mentioned, is on there. Uh, Brother Don, your, your devotions were wonderful this morning. You, there was a slide on there. He mentioned that rewards, the judgment seat of Christ. I called to mind we have a book uh, written by a Dallas Seminary graduate, uh, a late professor at SCS. Unfortunately, he died a few years ago. But a wonderful exegetical uh, book on the rewards in the judgment seat of Christ, uh, which is there as well. So all kinds of wonderful things, um, different books that I think would interest you if you get on the website. But uh, for now, please get on the website and just give us your info, and I promise uh, we won't hound you uh, too much, um, and uh, we'll give you that 30% discount. So this chapter, or this paper, is really the chapter of the first of the, of the book. So you guys are getting a preview. Um, it's going to be a little bit different by the time the book comes out, but uh, this, is, this is basically it. Discovering dispensationalism, tracing the development of dispensational thought from the 1st to the 21st century. Um, as we all know in this room, how often is dispensationalism a misunderstood theology? The following are real statements by real people that appeared on social media early in early 2020. The only things that I altered are the personal names. Dan Alice says this, dispensationalism, junk theology, for those with no knowledge of ancient history or terms and phrases of the day, and the willingness to simply ignore John's direct statements that these events were soon to come. Christopher Hill, he says this, utterly false and laughable. Dispensationalism is a novelty for the untutored. Try not to be offended, anybody here in the room, like I was when I read these for the first time. <laughs> it has done horrible damage, and that is why it's revised every few years, right? As if other systems of theology aren't revised every so often. Shocking to find a young person gripped in it. You need better peers, Chris said to someone. Amy Marshall, she says this, American churchianity led by dispensationalism is utterly oblivious to the fact that Israel is a nation guilty of war crimes and atrocities just like every other. Not a good look for the church. I don't believe a single good thing has ever come out of dispensationalism. Lori Lancer, she ends it with this, dispensationalism is the Jesuits' creation to lead the gullible away from the reformed emphasis on the Pope being the Antichrist. Now, I gotta give her a little bit of credit. There's a kernel of truth in what she's saying with the reformers thinking the Pope was the Antichrist, right? But then she blows it with this part here. <laughs> Dispensationalism appeared with the printing of the Schofield Bible in 1909, and Presbyterians were not the first converts. Then, as now, Presbyterians are well educated. The implication they would never be dispensationalists bypassing the historical fact that just about all the uh, early 19th century and 20th century dispensational scholars were from the Presbyterian tradition. <clears throat> Such comments are unfortunately not uncommon, and I know many of you in this room have dealt with things just like this. In fact, many more can be given as these were taken from a single post on a single day that started with five simple words on Facebook. Dispensationalism advances the reform legacy. That was it. I had nothing to do with that post. Nobody with the, uh, 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 that, that contributed or were involved with our book, Forged from Reformation, How Dispensational Thought Advances the Reform Legacy. None of us had anything to do with this. Apparently somebody got the book and just posted our subtitle on Facebook and it just lit up. Dispensationalists encounter such a disparaging remarks as often as race car drivers do who, uh, against those who suppose NASCAR is not a sport 
And of course, we all know that NASCAR is a sport, right? These misguided, uninformed assertions traverse the dialectical landscape from popular level discourses, or discussions rather, on social media, to academic publications, whether book, scholarly books, or journal articles. Uh, by the way, and I have a footnote here, I just had to say this, that there's no doubt that mainline Christian publishers um, are very biased against dispensationalism, and those, uh, there's many you know, publishers and those who have been published in the room can attest to that. Uh, they have, in, within the evangelical realm, definitely have a bias toward Reformed Covenantal um, publications, which was why, really, we started SCS Press several years ago uh, to be a voice for academic dispensational theology. <clears throat> you know, uh, covenant reform books have the corner market on publications, on publishers. That's what goes to the ivory towers, which trickles down to the pulpits. Uh, so we are very convicted over that and wanted to be a voice for traditional academic dispensationalism. We started SCS Press. So that was some social media comments. In the world of academia, published rhetoric hurled at dispensational thought has been fueled by vitriol matched only by the most extreme Trump critic. Common descriptions of dispensational thought include, and these are real from academic scholarly works, dispensationalism is a recent invention, anti-intellectual, antinomian, the false gospel of prosperity, oppressive, dangerous, guilty of societal neglect, and a selfish non-concern for the world. And I just took some of these from some of these more familiar, popular anti-dispensational books that are there. Uh, for example, Gary Burge, Whose Land, Whose Promise, Michael Phillips, White Metropolis, Barbara Rossing, who's making a, a big splash in academia right now. Uh, the Rapture Exposed, she wrote. And of course, R.C. Sproul, who can forget him, What is Reformed Theology? And uh, Greg Monson and Kenneth Gentry, and the list goes on, John Gerstner. <laughs> Ad hominem mantras like leave, leave behind, left behind are now the norm within the academy intended to mock dispensationalists by calling to mind sensationalized movie scenes and doomsday novels. For example, you see it there in footnote five, Leah Shade and Jerry Sumney, uh, Sumney they just published Apocalypse When, a guide to interpreting and preaching an apocalyptic text. And uh, Leah, she just goes off on dispensationalism, talking about how wrong it is, but interestingly enough, never actually disproves anything. Our main problem with it, she makes it clear, is that it just frightened her. The rapture doctrine and the future antichrist frightened her as a child. And apparently that was a reason to discard it all. And of course she goes on to talk about how all the problems dispensationalism caused, not least of which is white nationalism. Remarkably, one scholar, and this is still in the academic scholarly world of which, which I operate here, so this is just from the academic scholarly side. These are the guys who write the commentaries, the monographs, uh, the journal articles that get researched, right, and, and end up in dissertations. Remarkably, one scholar even claimed that dispensationalism is more anti-Semitic than replacement theology. Now, how is that? In a stunning display of ad hominem pompacity, Kenneth Gentry, Tommy, your old friend, can the gentry critique dispensationalists for celebrating the return of Jews to Israel out of an assumed sick prophetic anticipation for their eventual wholesale slaughter? And let that sit in. What this guy is saying, who is a very respected, uh, very reformed uh, uh, scholar, is saying that we, and I'm going to blanket everybody in the room, assume that we're all dispensationalists, maybe you're not, but I'll just, you know, for, 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 for simplicity's sake, saying that we as dispensationalists, we celebrate the fact that Jews have returned to Israel because we know God's going to judge them in the tribulation and wipe every, just about all of them out, and then Christ will come back. So we're actually happy for their eventual wholesale slaughter, he says. That makes us more anti-Semitic than replacement theology. Another recent critic went so far not only to dismiss dispensationalism as a recent novelty, but also condemn its rapture theology as inherently and historically racist. This came out in uh, Perspectives in Religious Studies. Um, a guy named Nathaniel Grimes wrote an article that was published in a very, at, at Baylor University, a respectable academic journal, uh, journals that uh, said, yes, if you believe in the preacher of rapture, you are uh, racist. It's a historically racist doctrine. The idea being whites who believed in this just wanted to escape and leave minorities who were oppressed. That's how it's been talked about within academia. I wrote an article uh, critiquing Grimes' article, calling out the how flawed his research was. It was terrible. 
Very well written article, though, ironically enough, and the guy could write, which is why it got published. But his, his research methodologies, his sources he used, his misunderstandings of, of things were all off the charts. So I wrote a very uh, uh, charitable but very stern critique, and I submitted it to Baylor University as a response from a traditional dispensational perspective calling out what he did. And of course, it was just rejected, declined. I didn't have any comments of why. Um, fortunately, though, it, is getting, it got picked up by Journal of Ministry and Theology uh, in, the, in the next, the most recent uh, uh, edition where I address that particular charge. And still another published a lengthy monograph dealing major research endeavors performed over the years on the book of Revelation and splattered dismissive remarks about dispensational positions along the way. Uh, of course, this is uh, Russell Morton in his recent research on Revelation published by Sheffield uh, Phoenix Press. Um, the author, a respected uh, professor of New Testament in an American seminary, presented thorough approaches reflecting, now check this out, he's talking about recent research on Revelation, the book of Revelation. He talks about uh, thorough uh, approaches reflecting history of religions approach, the theological approach, a pacifist approach, a feminist approach. I believe a queer approach is in there as well, and I forgot to put it in here. And even post-colonial perspectives on the book of Revelation. But when it came to dispensational premillennialism, he thought it sufficient to exclude any real treatment whatsoever. Curiously, he dismissed, dismissed out of hand approaches to Revelation, which can be traced uh, to the second century, as just simply sensational and unwarranted throughout the book. Picking up on the obvious lacuna, another New Testament professor in the Netherlands uncritically accepted the book's astonishing neglect of literal millenarian perspectives, uh, assuming that, quote, no scholarly defense of dispensational premillennialism exists, end quote. The ignorance of dispensational thought by these newer scholars is not surprising as the previous generation of critical scholarship set the bar high for such dismissals. One need, lo need not look any further than Stanley Grenz's and Roger Olson's critical survey, 20th Century Theology, that discusses punctuated positions of eschatology, so futurist eschat eschatology, not through the contributions of noted 20th century futurist thinkers. No, uh, notice the, the title of this book, 20th Century Theology, right? So he, they discuss eschatology in the futurist positions, uh, not through futurist thinkers in the 20th century like Alva McLean, John Walvert, or, or Dwight Pentecost, but through German existentialists and higher critics Boltmann, Moltmann, and Pannenberg. One fleeting remark concerning dispensational thought appears in Grant and Olson, placing it within, quote, a retreating fortress of anti-intellectual emotion and juxtaposing it with the charismatic movement. That's all they say about dispensationalism. In light of such dismissals, it is certainly hopeful that some critics of dispensationalism, such as Professor of New Testament in Greek at Southeastern Baptist Seminary, Benjamin Merkel, chose to lend a more fair and accurate voice, understanding that the premillennial view of Revelation 20, and he is not a premillennialist by any stretch, at least he says this in Evangelical Quarterly, has many, uh, the, the pre-mill uh, pre view has many able defenders, both past and present, and is considered a theologically acceptable interpretation for evangelical Christians, and he's absolutely right. The portrait of dispensational thought in the popular or non-academic world fares no better. If unsure, the social media comments earlier should remove any doubt. A dispensationalist who speaks of distinctions such as that between Israel and the church, or who advocates for an imminent rapture of the church, will not go long before enduring erroneous mantras made popular by lay critics, and we've all heard these, Nobody before Darby ever held to such beliefs. Dispensationalism was invented in the 19th century. Dispensationalism, dispensationalism only cares about their prophecy charts. No disrespect, Tommy, you have wonderful prophecy charts, as is Wayne House here. But they would think that's all we care about. Indeed, if there was ever a boogeyman in Christian theology, dispensationalism is it. And if such discussions and comments are indicators of the current milieu regarding dispensational thought, a corrective is desperately needed for age-old misconceptions, hence this book, and the card that you have in front of you, Discovering Dispensationalism, Tracing Dispensational Thought from the 1st to the 21st Century. Now, what is our contribution to this discussion? Of course, many worthwhile treatments explaining 
or defending dispensationalism exist and have for some time. Indeed, dispensational scholarship enjoys a rich literary heritage. And I don't have time to go through all of the books. Some of you in this room have written them uh, and certainly know of them. But there's some highlights there in in footnote 15, uh, going back to Eric Sauer, From Eternity to Eternity. Uh, Larry Crutchfield has a wonderful book, The Origins of Dispensationalism, The Darby Factor, uh, Block and Basings, uh, Basing and, uh, excuse me, Blazing and Box, Dispensationalism, Israel and the Church, Dale DeWitt, Dispensational Theology in America, it goes on. Charles Ryrie, of course, Dispensationalism, uh, Paul Wilkinson, who is usually here at this conference uh, for Zion's sake, uh, goes on. Todd Magnum, The Dispensational Covenantal Rift, and of course, you'll see William Watson at the bottom there, Dispensationalism before Darby. So we have a very rich very comprehensive legacy of scholarship that's just ignored. Excuse me. In this sense, the current volume merely adds to an ongoing discussion while gratefully acknowledging those dispensational giants of the past and present who have and continue to equip both the church and the academy through consistent literal hermeneutics, inductive exegesis, and biblical theology. Yet, in another sense, This book does break new ground. As far as we are aware, never before has a single dispensational book contained the eclectic cadre of contributors, as does this one. That is, highly credentialed experts with diverse backgrounds from around the world who might otherwise, and do, disagree with one another. Yet, they each remain united in their commitment to help readers discover the impressive historical legacy of dispensational thought. Within this book, for example, we have primary voices from traditional dispensationalism, mid-acts, or sometimes called hyper-dispensationalism. Even brethren perspectives are represented in this volume, each having been sought out by myself and my co-editor, James Fazio, due to their uh, respected expertise. Uh, And you'll hear a little bit from James later as we continue on throughout the afternoon of this particular book. These scholars were tasked to give a first-hand historical accounting of dispensational ideas as they developed from the New Testament through the patristics into the Middle Ages and era surrounding the Reformation to Darby's monumental contribution and landing on how that affected and continues to affect American evangelicalism today. The various authors of this project are active professors, historians, biographers, and theologians who have impressive publishing pedigree who teach at the college and seminary levels. Like its predecessor, as I mentioned earlier, Forged from Reformation, How Dispensational Thought Advances the Reform Legacy that SCS Press published 2017. This new volume, Discovering Dispensationalism, Tracing the Development of Dispensational Thought from the 1st to the 21st Century, is a first in its bold yet responsibly demonstrated Claims and I, and I have a footnote there uh, talking about the fact that there's many contributors to this volume. It's not written by a single dispensationalist, and it's not written by a single non-dispensationalist. Immediately sets it apart from those books that are, are, are most popular, mostly referenced, um, generally in academia, of a dispensational perspective. Unfortunately, it's usually the non-dispensationalist who writes the book on dispensationalism that gets uh, referenced the most. Um, some of the most, you would be familiar with them, uh, uncharitable diatribes written of our position, John Gerstner and, and William Cox from several decades ago. Uh, but there are some newer ones out today. But either way, this book having firsthand perspectives, that is, people within that camp, whether it's traditional or progressive, mid-acts, uh, sets it apart from everything else. What is our goal of the book? And I wanted to be very clear with this. Because there are some book reviews that are out there of our other book, uh, Forged from Reformation, How Dispensational Thought Advances the Reform Legacy, as well as a few other books. And sometimes a book review, someone doesn't really know how to write one, and they, they confuse the thesis, the goal, they don't see what the, the purpose or the scope of the book is. So I want to be very clear what we're trying to do. Our goal, important caveats must be stated. That is, it is helpful here to clarify what this book does not set out to do. First, the volume does not claim a monopoly or complete ownership of ideas customary to dispensationalism. For example, the premillennial return of Christ or grammatical historical hermeneutic. There have been numerous positions throughout history shared by both dispensationalists and non-dispensationalists alike, barring wholesale claims by either side. So we're not going to say because we found premillennial ideas 
that is dispensationalism, you know, or because this scholar or this historian uh, reads scripture grammatically historical, then that's a dispensationalist, okay? Because you're going to see this across the board, even on the covenantal side, they will claim those things as well. Rather, uh, excuse me, there have been numerous positions throughout history shared, as I, as I mentioned, barring wholesale claims by either side. In fact, though most contributors of the book consider themselves dispensationalists, some actually do not in our book. But they're still writing, researching primary uh, uh, historical research, right? Primary evidence, firsthand evidence. In other words, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, some do not, rather the goal to which each author has commi- is committed is, is an honest historical appraisal of theological ideas within a specific era in church history that reflect distinct dispensational beliefs. In other words, this book seeks to trace historically where and when these ideas first emerged and how they found a home within what would be later termed dispensationalism. As such, no claim is made that dispensationalism as a system is as old as the New Testament, or even that certain figures in the church, uh, throughout church history, like the Apostolic Fathers, uh, considered themselves to be dispensationalists in the modern sense of the term. Like covenant theology or covenantalist, it is well known that technical nomenclature to describe a system or a person holding to a distinct pattern of beliefs, whether Reformed, Lutheran, Arminian, Calvinist, covenantal, or dispensational, did not exist until later in church history. Second, the book avoids hubris declarations such as dispensationalism is the system of the Bible or that the pure gospel is only found in dispensationalism. Uh, Believe it or not, and I have a very lengthy footnote here, this was actually published from, uh, uh, from, uh, from a Christian brother, a scholar, uh, a professor, a church history professor at Southern Baptist Seminary uh, in a recent festrift in honor of Thomas Schreiner. It's pretty remarkable. He writes the, book, the chapter on covenant theology and literally says in that chapter, covenant theology then is the gospel. And he goes on to say the covenant of grace then is the gospel. I mean, I read this and my mind was blown going, how did this get published? So I actually immediately contacted, his name was Sean Wright, history professor at Southern Seminary. I said, did you really say this? This is what you meant. You're equating your theological system with the gospel. How can you be so irresponsible? Of course, he clarified with me that he does teach the biblical gospel, to which I have no doubt. Um, But the statements remain in that particular book that's in honor of Tom Schreiner's biblical theology book. Um, And again, that just shows how far some Christian publishers are willing to go in in their bias toward covenant theology and not dispensationalism. Imagine a dispensationalist standing here or publishing a work saying, dispensationalism is the gospel, right? Right? I mean, we would, as if we don't get mocked enough. I mean, that would be, we'd be having stones thrown at us at that point. Okay. <clears throat> Adherence to any theological system, including dispensationalists, need to approach their task with humility, recognizing that blind spots may indeed exist in their method and that it often takes one's opponents rightfully to point them out. Thus, an apologetic contending for the system's truth, value, or accuracy is not the aim of our book. Although, you know, although I would believe that it's true, that's not the aim of the book, okay? Rather, the book is, a, is descriptive. It's not polemical. And as such, intends a more modest and realistic goal. Consequently, the aim of the volume is merely to demonstrate that the historical fact that ideas that are advanced most clearly and consistently within dispensational thought existed throughout the history of the church. In other words, the dispensational system did not invent them Rather, it was formed by them. And if these ideas are judged to be true or not, it's left to the reader's own discretion and falls, out the scope, falls outside the scope of the volume. So we are just doing a historical tracing uh, 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 from experts dealing with primary evidence within that particular era in church history to which we've assigned them. And that's it. Who is our audience for the book? Who's going to benefit most from this book? The various academic yet accessible contributions in, in the book and what follows makes the book uniquely viable for its intended dual audience, namely the church and the academy. Now, because that gets used a lot, well, it'll hit both church and academy. We need to narrow that down just a little bit. All right? Because such targets can be vague, it's helpful to narrow it down. Discovering dispensationalism will best serve, I think, the church pastor 
who too often falls into sermonizing theology in loose categories. The inquisitive church member who hears suspect rumors about dispensational beliefs, like earlier in the, in the presentation. The seminary student who is taking a course on theological systems and the scholar seeking a well-documented resource on the history of dispensational thought. Now, by no means excluding its value for interested lay church group leaders, like if you want to use this book in a, in a group study, absolutely, that's wonderful. But adoption of this volume as a textbook in Bible colleges and seminaries would probably be its most suitable fit. And for those of us that are professors in the room who teach, um, I would certainly encourage to assign this book in, in, in your theological uh, courses. Uh, our other books have done that very well, have suited just fine in uh, Bible colleges and seminaries. And this, is, uh, this just continues that line. As such, almost a dozen leading scholars representing the entire spectrum of dispensational thought have assembled in this volume. They have done so to offer a well-researched corrective on the vast sea of unqualified opinions regarding the history of dispensationalism, opinions that continue to promulgate despite the evidence that dispensational theology is a recent novelty with fanciful or unstantiated doctrines. From experts engaging primary sources vis-a-vis -vis distinct historical periods, a diachronic study is presented in the volume that traces various elements pertinent to dispensational thought from the New Testament to the present day. Numerous milestones that emerged over two millennia, which in time would be codified in the theological system known as dispensationalism, are plotted and assessed, demonstrating the significance of a, dis a dispensational framework uh, the significance that it has had on Christian theology. So I want to do a very brief uh, chapter overview. What is the DNA of this book? Right? Here's gonna, you're going to get a very brief summary on all the chapters. The volume is deftly structured around three major geographies that neatly trace the development of dispensational thought as it progressed throughout the world. If we took big chunks that, I'm calling, that we're calling in the ancient Mediterranean, and going on to into vintage Europe, and then finally into America. Such a progression begins with dispensational ideas as they originated and expanded. Chapters one to four is dispensational thought in the ancient Mediterranean, and how it matured through vintage Europe in chapters five and eight, and systematized in modern America, chapters nine through 12. Within each geographical prong, Four specific milestones are plotted that demonstrate the maturing of patterns of belief that would later be codified in the system known as dispensationalism. Wrapping up the book is a final chapter surveying dispensational thought in retrospect while offering perspe a perspective on trajectories for future expressions of dispensationalism. So we, we break these chapters down in, in, in groups of three, how dispensational thought developed and started really with the New Testament and ended to where we are today. The first block, dispensational thought in the ancient Mediterranean. Excuse me. A historical tracing of dispensational thought must begin by examining its very nomenclature. Initiating the discussion is the volume's first chapter written by my co-editor, James Fazio of Southern California Seminary. Demystifying the term dispensation, or oikonomia in the Greek, Fazio offers an exegetical study of the word and concept that is both consistent to the biblical text and sensitive to the socio-historical milieus out of which the word appears. By focusing specifically on Jesus and the apostles' use of dispensation against the backdrop of Second Temple and early Christian literature, Fazio clarifies its meaning and delimits its theological usage in a matter taking into full account the terms historical, grammatical, and cultural context. Emerging from such a study are ideas pertaining to God's administration of the earth throughout time. As the chapter unfolds, a suitable definition for dispensation, or oikonomia, is given that respects each corner of its biblical and contemporary usage. Quote, this is the, dispensa this is the definition for dispensation that Fazio offers. A dispensation is an administration of a household, whereby a steward is appointed to manage his master's goods in order to yield a surplus for which he will be ultimately judged according to his faithfulness as a steward, end quote. From here, the groundwork is laid upon which each succeeding chapter and historical period develops in the history of dispensational thought. And, and Dr. Fazio will be up here uh, after lunch discussing this chapter a little bit more and offers not just an, uh, a definition for our economy, a dispensation, uh, but also the system dispensationalism, because those terms need to be clarified. 
That was chapter one. The period immediately following the New Testament is tenuous at best. The complexities of patristic theology are due to the array of collective voices from church fathers still coming to grips with the crucified Jewish Messiah in his gospel. An unfortunate result is that this critical period in church history, which is the second century, is often neglected in relation to development of theology, especially as it relates to later theological systems. Bridging the gap, Paul Hartog of Faith Baptist Bible College and Seminary contributes a unique essay in chapter two by bringing into conversation the works of two prominent patristic scholars, one dispensational, who's Larry Crutchfield, and the other non-dispensational, who's Charles Hill, both of, him, both of whom hold differing conclusions concerning early Keliism or what we call premillennialism. Maintaining a close examination of these scholars, coupled with his own balanced interaction with primary sources, Hartog demonstrates that hermeneutics is the perennial issue at play. Isn't that right? Hermeneutics is always the perennial issue at play. I mean, that's why it's perennial. Everything boils down to hermeneutics. Particularly relevant to the discussion is that interpretive approaches from this period, this early period which uh, upheld a Jewish understanding of the Old Testament were anything but novel. Indeed, such approaches led to what would be later accepted as premillennialism, the end times position customary to dispensational thought. In chapter 3, Jeremiah Muti of Southern California Seminary picks up where Hartog's analysis ends by examining nascent dispensational ideas within the period known as the Nicene era, or the third and fourth centuries. The transition from the pre-Nicene to Nicene age marked significant changes in the area of biblical hermeneutics, most notably exhibited by the contrast of consistent literal methods with those adopting allegorical approaches to scripture. As a result, rudimentary forms of dispensational eschatology began to wane in this rich period, even more so as errant groups began to adopt earlier forms of Keliism or premillennial eschatology. However, Moody challenges the perception that with the onset of allegorizing scripture during this era, ideas resulting from a literal approach simply just disappeared, and that's the argument that he is pushing against. As the chapter unfolds, enough evidence is recovered from the Nicene writers that suggest pockets of what, was, what is now called dispensationalism continued to flourish and develop despite the fanciful interpretations offered by allegorizers or positions uh, appropriated by fit fringe groups, for example, the Gnostics during that time. Perhaps the most surprising discovery from Muti's analysis is the ironic fact that even some of the leading allegorists couldn't, could not completely detach themselves from a dispensational literalism on various points of eschatology. Following the Nicene era was the vast epoch within church history spanning the 5th to the 15th centuries known as the medieval period. While historians tend to focus on seismic shifts that occurred during this time, Fell swoops have caused scholars to overlook subtle, yet important, theological developments that took place. In chapter 4, uh, the late William Watson, Colorado Christian University's William Watson, takes a scalpel to surviving medieval documents and provides a gripping analysis of the development of dispensational thought from this nebulous period of history. By focusing on dispensational ideas spanning both the late antiquity in late medieval centuries, Watson demonstrates that contrary to popular mantras mistakenly tagging dispensationalism as an entirely modern era inventive, pervasive what he calls proto-dispensational elements were certainly present and developing during these periods. Included in Watson's findings are medieval thinkers who divided history into distinct periods in which God deals with humanity, a belief in a personal and future antichrist, a literal rapture of God's people, and a future restoration of the Jewish nation, all of which resulted from a growing remnant of literal hermeneutic practitioners. Employing a keen eye to primary sources, Watson convincingly shows that while such positions may not neatly reflect those of later dispensationalists, they do represent a tenor much closer to modern dispensationalism than to other eschatological schemes promoted throughout history. So that closes off the first chunk, if you will, of dispensational thought, its earliest expressions within the ancient Mediterranean. Then this moves us into what we call dispensational thought in vintage Europe. Chapter 5 
co-written by H. Wayne House of Faith International University, and uh, Wayne's here today, uh, and James Fazio of Southern California Seminary, provides the essential bridge connecting the late medieval period to the Puritan age by narrowing in on the Reformation, the Reformation era nestled between the 15th and 16th centuries. While all agree that the Protestant Reformation marked a revolution in Christian thought, not all are aware that it provided the scaffolding for the systemization of dispensational ideas that would emerge in the centuries that followed. One of the highlights brought to the fore by House and Fazio is that the reformers' approach to Christian doctrine broke from a millennium of ecclesiastical tradition that was tenuously rooted in apostolic succession. Moreover, the Renaissance that surrounded this era in the arts architecture and sciences was manifest in equal measure in the Christian church, most notably witnessed by a return to the original biblical languages. Convinced by the perspicuity of scripture, that is the clarity of scripture, uh, by implementing a principle of literal interpretation, released the reformers from the shackles of papal domination that constrained the church's reception of biblical doctrine. Now, though it would take centuries for the revolution to reach full maturation, House and Fazio suggest that the return to a reading of the Old and New Testaments in the original languages, rather than a recitation of Latin Roman Catholic dogma, laid the foundation for the exegetical renaissance that would ultimately result in the development of a cohesive and systematic formulation of dispensational thought. One of the most obscure periods of dispensational development within church history are the centuries immediately following the Reformation and preceding the bar- birth of John Nelson Darby. And let me just throw this out from a personal editor's side. This particular chapter was the hardest to fill <laughs> with an able scholar to be able to n- narrow in on this sliver of time right here of dispensational ideas. Uh, the 17th and 18th centuries are often overshadowed, and this is why it was hard to find uh, an able contributor for this particular chapter. The 17th and 18th centuries are often aver- overshadowed by Puritan reforms on one end and revivalist fervor on the other. Yet within this sliver of 200 years, critical developments took place that helped clarify previous medieval and Reformation scholarship in relation to national Israel and its continuance as a people of God. In chapter 6, and here's the man who did it, Mark A. Snowberger of Detroit Baptist Theological Seminary narrows in on thinkers within the 200 years preceding Darby who maintain clear instances of distinction between Israel and the church, or at a bare minimum, distinctions for Israel within the church, distinctives of dispensationalism since its earliest expressions. By examining extant primary sources, Snowberger draws conclusions suggesting many from the incapacious period considered national Israel to be a, quote, prominent, continuing, ethnic, and earthly people of God despite there being no such national state at the time. The chapter demonstrates beyond any doubt that while dispensationalism would not begin to be systematized until the 19th century, chief rudiments of dispensational thought precede the modern era by centuries. Now, closing off this particular group of uh, of, uh, dispensational thought in Europe, perhaps there is no bigger name attached to dispensational thought than John Nelson Darby. Many consider this 19th century native Englishman to be the father of modern dispensationalism. Indeed, his notoriety merited a chapter unto himself in the current volume as Darby signals a crucial era in the development of dispensational theology and its formation to an actual system. But the epitaph on his tombstone of this particular enigmatic figure in Dorset reads a phrase borrowed from the Apostle Paul. This is on John Nelson Darby's tombstone, as unknown and well-known. Fittingly, there is as much controversy as there is confusion surrounding the brethren leader and his impact on dispensationalism. Into this puzzlement, noted Darby biographer and critic Max Wermchuk steps in and contributes the, this volume's chapter 7, dealing, uh, detailing Darby's life and influences that eventually led to his, quote, reducing the theological chaos to a semblance of order, end quote. Despite the abundance of errant opinions concerning Darby, the chapter demonstrates that he did not invent any one doctrine of dispensationalism. For example, the notion of a pre-tribulational rapture or distinct div- uh, divine programs for Israel and the church. Rather, 
He more clearly developed ideas that had been promulgated throughout church history, a fact to which the book's previous chapters testify. Not shying away from Darby's overambitious drive that inevitably led to discord within his own constituencies, Waramchuk offers a fresh analysis from recently discovered firsthand, never before published sources of this unknown and well known thinker, a giant who will influence much of later evangelicalism by giving direction to modern expressions of dispensational thought. So that, break, that, that now completes the development of dispensationalism or dispensational thought through uh, vintage Europe. But how do we get from Darby and Europe? to the Pre-Trib Research Conference in Dallas, right? That's the next block, Dispensational Thought in Modern America. Chapter 8, written by Shepherd's Theological Seminary, Larry D. Pettigrew, represents a crucial pivot not only in the book, but also in the development of dispensationalism. By offering a historical appraisal of 19th century evangelicalism, Pettigrew traces the influences of Darby and previous European forms of dispensational thought across the Atlantic to the U.S. through the American Bible Conference movement. Explosive and evangelical fervor during a time when war and slavery cast their large shadows, the Bible Conference movement gave rise to North America's most definitive expressions of dispensational theology. The chapter documents that in addition to other factors, Darby's multiple visits to North America between 1862 and 1877 played a key role in introducing new audiences to prophecy conferences. In turn, these conferences ignited scores of church revivalists to age-old premillennialism, a passion for pre-tribulational rapture doctrine, as well as the belief in successive theological arrangements of God dealing with man leading to a future kingdom under Christ. Tease that out, over a century and a half, you get to Pre-Trib Research Center. Such positions were the fruit of an inductive approach to Scripture, the very basis of dispensationalism that leaders of the Bible Conference movements promoted. For this reason, notes Pettigrew, the emergence and effect of the American Bible Conference movement deserves special recognition for its role in the development of dispensational thought. Now, the fruit born from the 19th century Bible conferences developed into what chapter 9 calls the golden years of American dispensationalism. And this is now going to seem a little, this is, going to very, this is the chapter that's going to seem the most familiar to, to us here in the room. The golden era encapsulated much of the 20th century and featured such luminaries as C.I. Schofield, Lewis Berry Chafer, Alva McLean, John Walvoord, and Charles Ryrie, all of whom emerged from Reformed traditions. Throughout the chapter, our fearless leader, Tommy Ice of Calvary University and the Pre-Trib Research Center, traces the Calvinistic heritage of American dispensational thought, correcting the mistaken notion that dispensationalism and Calvinism represent polar opposites. Rather, continuity exists between the two, not only by the virtually exclusive Calvinist adherence of early dispensationalism, but also by the system's theological emphasis on God's sovereignty. As Ice contends, quote, dispensationalism is a theology about what God is doing through his plan for history and beyond. In light of such historic roots, the chapter surveys dispensational thought as advanced during its most, most formative years in evangelical history. Uh, that would be 1900 and 1970. Rejecting notions of novelty, Ice persuasively demonstrates the reformed heritage of dispensationalism as the system continued to develop its eschatology through a literal hermeneutic, resulting in positions considered more biblical than rival systems constraining God's plan for history in terms of personal salvation, which is all the rage in anything other than, non, than uh, dispensational circles that the Bible is about the redemption of man or historical redemptive hermeneutic. He's saying the opposite. As the chapter documents, the golden years of traditional dispensational premillennialism was advanced by a driven crop of younger scholars, many of whom cut their teeth at Dallas Seminary, who made a sizable impact disseminating dispensational thought throughout both the church and the academy. In addition to the most definitive expressions, let me just stop here for a second. This is one of the chapters. I mean, all the chapters are unique for their own reasons. This was one that sets this book particularly apart from anything written when there's multiple contributors on the history of dispensationalism or talking about dispensationalism. In addition to the most definitive expression of dispensational thought that arose during the golden years of American dispensationalism, 
another set of thinkers also began to rise who have not enjoyed such prominence. In fact, they have been among the most marginalized groups within the dispensational tradition, despite their legitimate place within its history. Contempt envelops outside labels and modifiers such as hyper or ultra or extreme, given to these sincere yet often misunderstood dispensationalists. Against this backdrop, chapter 10 marks an unprecedented effort in the history of modern dispensational scholarship by placing alongside other more familiar expressions of dispensationalism a development of the system too often discarded. To this, Philip J. Long of Grace Christian University offers a first-hand examination and corrective to what is properly called mid-acts dispensationalism. Expanding on the works of J.C. O'Hare, Cornelius Stamm, Charles Baker, uh, Long provides a historical analysis of the mid-acts tradition and addresses questions raised by these thinkers that are often assumed without critique. For example, situating the church's birth after Pentecost in the questioning or sometimes flat-out rejection of water baptism for believers today are among the more controversial positions of mid-acts dispensationalists. These and other views are addressed and clarified as the chapter unfolds from the birth of extreme dispensationalism tied to E.W. Bollinger to its more tempered and contemporary expressions of the mid-acts or what's called grace theology advanced by Dale DeWitt and the grace movement. Though mid-acts dispensationalism is often disparaged, and perhaps with some good reason, Long rightly concludes, quote, nevertheless, it serves as an undeniable example of the development of dispensational thinking in America, which continues to this day. As such, Long's essay is a welcomed contribution to the volume. And finally, chapter 11 serves as the book's final historical examination of dispensational thought, bringing the reader from the close of the 20th to the current state of affairs in the 21st century. In this final chapter, Dallas Theological Seminary's Daryl L. Bach offers an intimate first-hand analysis of a movement that serves as the most recent form of dispensationalism, one that is maintaining a sizable impact in the 21st century, and of course that is progressive dispensationalism. Offering fresh updates to his widely influential Jets essay, Why I Am a Dispensationalist with a Little D, came out in the late 90s, Bach traces the birth and development of, the progressive, of progressive dispensationalism and offers comparisons and contrasts to more traditional forms of dispensational thought along the way. Hermeneutical methods familiar to previous expressions of dispensationalism are challenged as are formerly tightly held distinctions such as the arrangement of individual dispensations and the relationships between Israel, the church, and the kingdom of God. Bach, himself a principal founder of the progressive movement, contends that the richness of the dispensational tradition is that it is anything but monolithic, a historical fact the various expressions throughout the volume demonstrate. By tracing the history and clarifying the core tenets of this progressive sub-tradition within dispensationalism, the chapter subtly underscores the plenteous legacy of dispensational thought, a tradition driven to advance the gospel of Christ and knowledge of scripture since the days of the apostles to the current era of Christianity. And that is, a, excuse me, that is a, a, an overview of the DNA, the chapters of the book, what you can expect. Um, obviously, I'm just hitting very broad highlights, uh, but within that chapter, everything is extremely well footnoted and documented. Uh, I know this because myself and, and, and James Fazio were, were editors of this and making sure that can hold up to the scrutiny of the critiques and challenges we know is going to, uh, to come. So, as we're we're rounding down here, a corrective on an age-old misconception. The chapters making up the volume's DNA clarify that dispensational thought is not as recent as commonly assumed. Moreover, the essays collectively demonstrate that dispensational theology subsumes various strands of doctrine that, while including eschatology, is certainly not limited to it. Hermeneutics, ecclesiology, Israelology and biblical history are just some of the subjects revolving around end times themes that appear throughout the book. Seen in this light, it is odd that scholars such as John Collins would continue to propagate the misconception that, quote, the main apocalyptic tradition in modern America is premillennial dispensationalism, which is based on a system formulated by John Nelson Darby. 
In actuality, the ideas for which Darby would become most known predate him by hundreds of years. Premillennialism can be traced to the anti nicene fathers, while literal hermeneutics and a future restoration for ethnic Israel enjoyed advocacy throughout the medieval and enlightenment periods leading up to Darby. In other words, contrary to Collins and others, the dispensational scheme was not formulated by Darby. It merely continued through him as it developed into its most definitive expressions after him. Additionally, as this volume attempts to demonstrate, dispensational thought is not a, and these are further quotes from John Collins, who is a very well-respected a respected apocalyptic scholar. Additionally, this volume t- uh, tries to demonstrate, excuse me, I don't know why my Mac does that. <laughs> my emails pop up, and here we go. <clears throat> The volume attempt, uh, attempts to demonstrate dispensational thought is not a, quote, continual attempt to identify and decode proof texts, nor a reduction variant of apocalypticism, apocalypticism that is, quote, a mainly pre, that is mainly preoccupied with signs of the end, all from John Collins. Rather, dispensational theology has shown itself to be a diachronic biblical theology that views God's manifesting himself progressively throughout Scripture's storyline in varied ways while continually bl- bringing glory to himself. While there will continue to be those who vilify dispensationalism as, again, more quotes from John Collins, irrational superstition, propagated by smugly self-congratulatory political conservatives who refuse scientific advances, that's how we're looked at, the trajectory of of, of scholarship within dispensational thought is remarkably more advanced and inclusive to the academic guild. By its eclectic cadre of scholars representing the entire spectrum of dispensationalism and beyond, this volume is merely the most recent contribution to correcting outdated misconceptions. Ultimately, as the book sets out to demonstrate, dispensationalism did not appear in a vacuum or as the brainchild of one, any one individual. Its history of ideas can be traced with incredible precision from the 21st century back to the 1st century and vice versa. Conclusion. Though our sincere prayer is that the book helps establish the historical development, correct misunderstandings, and clarify mischaracterizations of dispensationalism, our greatest desire, of course, is that it brings honor and glory to our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, Titus 2.13. Of course, critics are anticipated. I mean, come on, what good book isn't worth critiquing, right? Yet, before conclusions are drawn, we trust they will first take into account the, uh, the rigorous historical research fueled by a love for truth shared by each of our esteemed contributors. And most certainly, we hope for any challenges to be marked by irenic, collegial dialogue befitting of Christian scholarship. As one of our distinguished authors rightly pointed out, quote, traditions can be of value as they dialogue with each other and correct each other's blind spots. That can only happen when traditions are properly understood. Such is the aim of discovering dispensationalism, tracing the development of dispensational thought from the 1st to the 21st century. And with that, I close this introduction and this talk for this morning uh, and commend to you future readers of the book, once it's released, (laughs) uh, that uh, God will be glorified by our efforts in putting this uh, book together, which has taken several years now. Of course, perhaps no better fitting send-off can compare to Paul who eloquently declared in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink or research and write, do all things to the glory of God. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions, comments, testimonies, not too long though. Uh, (laughs) So everybody got on the website and already ordered the book, right? Awesome. Right. There's an, yes, okay. Excellent presentation. Thank you for your hard work. Uh, You made an early reference to uh, inductive exegesis. I took or understood that to be in reference to the simple fact that words like uh, rapture and predispensationalism are not from the scripture text but are taught there. Did I understand it correctly, or could you elaborate? Uh, I'd love to elaborate on that. So one of the misconceptions is, is, is one uh, that you just alluded to, the idea that the word rapture is not in the New Testament. That is entirely false. Uh, 
the word rapture just comes from the Latin ratio, which is the, if you were get a Latin Vulgate, it would be there in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 17, the Greek word harpazo, catching up, snatching away. Uh, that is the rapture. That is the, the word where it would in time be translated in English as rapture. So rapture is certainly in there. In fact, one of the, uh, the scholarly accounts, uh, the critics, uh, Barbara Rossing, in her book, her monograph, The Rapture Exposed, she starts off with that. And it's been promulgated by critics throughout history that the word rapture does not exist in the New Testament. And it's, it's mind-boggling when all you got to do is just a simple word study, right? And, and, and we don't just do word studies. We branch out to concepts and themes. But rapture most certainly is, as well as the word dispensation, is, is one of our... One of our strengths, as opposed to covenant theology, is that dispensationalism is at least based on a word, or economia, that is in the New Testament, and we use the word properly, as uh, my colleague James Fazio will present in his, his talk. Yeah, the word harpazo, uh, what you had is starting around the late 1600s and 1700s, uh, scholars from all over Europe would meet with one another and they used Latin as the means of communication. So if you look at Oxford English Dictionary of the use of the word rapture, uh, it, it developed uh, because of people using Latin to communicate with and it becomes a popular term, as he says, to uh, translate harpazo, you know, the Greek word. Uh, for rapture, and so that is a specious argument to say the rapture doesn't occur in the Bible. Well, it does occur in the Latin Vulgate, uh, so it depends on what t translation you use. How many of y'all uh, use a Latin Vulgate as your <laughs> main text? <laughs> I do because rapture is there. Right? Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> Great. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Excellent presentation, thank you. Uh, I was trained in traditional dispensationalism. I've tried to understand progressive dispensationalism, but I don't know how successful I am. Uh, I noticed that one of your talk, I was wondering if you could just give a simple definition or explanation of how progressive dispensationalism uh, differs. Well, yeah, it's um, one of the one of the uh, unique things about this book is that you'll see Daryl Bach is, I mean, this is an alphabetic, alphabetical order of last name, that's why he's listed first, uh, uh, not in correction of a system, <laughs> because his last name, Bach, we're very familiar with Dr. Uh, Daryl Bach, Dr. Bach from Dallas Seminary, he's one of the principal founders of progressive dispensationalism, uh, Tommy can certainly say more about this than, than me, but in the chapter, um, he does, to his credit, and he was the first, by the way, to get his chapter back to us, <laughs> which was very much appreciated. Um, he actually was very uh, delighted to be in a book alongside Tommy and, and other expressions of a more traditional dispensationalism, which was, which was really encouraging to see. Uh, but the movement started, he talks about it within his chapter in the mid 80s with a study group that happened from ETS, Evangelical Theological Society. A group of dispensationalists got together and started thinking of these ideas of how, we, how, how they can progress past older forms of dispensational thought. Their primary differences, and there are different, there are different versions, whether you follow a Daryl Bach, progressive dispensationalism, or, um, or um, uh, Bruce Ware, who is now in the Southern Baptist Seminary, who's probably the most prominent modern progressive dispensationalism in the SBC, uh, they, would, they would not have such uh, rigid lines between the different economies or dispensations throughout time. Uh, their principal, I would say, error, if I can, very charitably, what I would disagree with and what many of us would, is that they believe that Jesus is currently on the Davidic throne, and so the kingdom of God has been established. Um, and so a future for national Israel, uh, they still uphold that for the most part, but it's certainly not as robust and rich because they, they see Jesus already on the, on the kingdom throne, on the throne, the Davidic throne. So. And, and most importantly... As some might say that, you know, they don't even qualify as true dispensationalists, I, I would hold a different opinion, but uh, the critique, and it's certainly a critique, is that their hermeneutical method is not consistent. They are, they would advocate what they call a complementary hermeneutic, which really is taking the New Testament and, I would say, unfortunately, reading new meanings back into the Old Testament uh, to come to their positions. And tell me, you might want to say something more. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, I was... The, uh, very much involved in talking to Blazing and Bach, and who's the guy at Talbot? Uh, 
uh, Saucy. Saucy. I can I consider him the the father of progressive dispensationalism. I spent four hours talking to him one time years ago uh, and stuff, but. It, they they brought in the already not yet concept, which I think is invalid, because you, that that is to me like an existential type use of language where we're in the kingdom now, but we're not already not yet. You know, and that comes from uh, the British guy over there. I forget his name. Dodd. Dodd. Yeah, he he developed that originally. And so, you know, it, it's just approaching everything from a different dialectic. But I, I think they destroy, the progressives destroy dispensationalism because they merge, they break down the distinction between Israel and the church. And Daryl Bach and Craig Blazing continue to be very strong pre-tribulationalists, but none of their disciples that I know of are. You know what I mean? And... Uh, we had a, uh, a one of our faculty members who's usually here. He's been here consistently every year, but uh, because of COVID, couldn't I'm assuming couldn't travel. Uh, his name is Brian Moulton. He's a professor at San Diego Christian College. He was one of our contributors for Forge Information. He, he gave a paper last year. He, okay, yeah, exactly. He was here presenting last year. He had gotten his his doctor his PhD under Daryl Bach, and uh, has some wonderful stories of them kind of butting heads because he's because kind of, Moulton Brian Moulton, our colleague, would. It's coming out from a, a traditional dispensational approach and a pre-trib rapture, and, and Bach uh, gave him many, many, many uh, <laughs> challenges along the way. So it's an interesting discussion. If he was here, he could, be, he could talk about these, these wonderful uh, uh, challenges and, and little arguments they had along the way for him to get Yeah, to well, Daryl believes dialogue is a virtue, and that's what he's always trying to do is get you into dialogue. Uh, but... Uh, I, I th like I say, I think the reason progressive dispensation developed is you read all of this uh, despairing comments early about dispensationalists, and you can't really be a scholar and be a dispensationalist, a traditional dispensationalist. And progressive dispensationalism was changes that allowed you to be considered a scholar, like Daryl and Blazing and those other guys, and uh, but yet hold to dispensationalism because they taught at, dispens for, you know, I would say formerly dispensational schools and things. Yeah, we, uh, at SCS, uh, other than Shasta Bible College, when George Gunn was here earlier, I don't know if he still is, but uh, I, 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 we make light with George that Shasta is up in Redding, Northern California. We're down in San Diego, and we're the only two schools balancing out that crazy state uh, for a traditional, conservative, dispensational, young earth creation perspective, all that wonderful fundamentalist uh, doctrines that we hold to. Um, but we at SES, we're older, and we're kind of... Southern California's best kept secret. We're 15, 20 minutes away from Westminster uh, Seminary in, in, in California. Uh, and I converse with Michael Horton often for different things. Um, and we have Talbot Seminary up the road, Master Seminary. Uh, but we're the oldest fully accredited traditional dispensational uh, seminary on the left coast that I'm aware of. It's 1946. We're, we're actually older than Israel right now, National State of Israel. So uh, we're holding that line and, and, uh, and of course, proud to be here representing at uh, pre -trib. Go ahead. Yes. Was the early concept of American manifest destiny ever a part of the early growth of dispensationalism? I w is it a question for me or for Tommy? Yeah, I, I would say, well, first of all, I would say it's, it, it wasn't, <laughs> that was a post-millennial perspective uh, that got steam before World War I or it became also, you know, manifest destiny and building a, a kingdom of God, if you will, on a, on a, on a be as a beacon light on the hill. Uh, it was a post-millennial perspective uh, that we are to advance uh, a, a utopian society. I wouldn't say it, if it helped develop dispensationalism, only, if they did only in the sense that we were able to maybe find, have more finer points uh, of dispute, uh, perhaps, but that particular mantra, um, I forgot the, the president who made it famous, but it really came from a newspaper publication. Andrew Jackson. It goes back to Andrew Jackson. And uh, it began in the 1830s, 1840s, yeah. the idea of manifest destiny that 
we were destined to take over the all the way to the left coast. <laughs> and uh, uh, that was a post-millennial development and everything. And uh, But that was developed uh, during the Jacksonian era. Yeah, I would, uh, this is something I caution in my own church and students. Um, I've been guilty of it at, at the more, not, not so much anymore, well, not at all anymore actually, but uh, growing in my understanding of scripture and correct theology and landing on what we would consider traditional or normative dispensationalism, as much as Bach hates that term, normative dispensationalism. Um, uh, you know, we use very loose language in the church. Uh, and, this is, and this is something for you pastors in the room. I, I, would, I would highly encourage you never say things like, we are you know, building God's kingdom or we're advancing the kingdom, uh, we're doing kingdom work. I mean, these are, they've turned into sort of Christianese, you know, these churchy terms. Um, but they're very loose categories. And we get students at SCS, you know, doing their bachelor's in biblical studies all the way up to their THM, and they're bringing in this language, and then they, they get a, a, a course that I teach and I co-teach with, with James Fazio, where we compare uh, dispensationalism with covenant theology, um, and they hear these concepts, they just assume that we are building God's kingdom, which of course is post-millennialism. And when they get the lecture on premillennialism. Um, it's quite an awakening, and uh, you can usually trace it to, well, my pastor says this, or I hear in prayers, you know, the end of a prayer oftentimes, it's loose language, you know, as we advance God's kingdom together, um, you know, I just encourage you to be a little bit more sharper with your language, for those who, who might do that, and like I said, I was one of those guys that used to do that as well. Um, uh, yes? Yeah, Darrell Bach was one of my uh, colleagues as I went through in Dallas Seminary. It seems like when they go over to uh, Europe, they interact with the scholars over there and come back different. Do you all interact in the book in that way, in any way of in interacting with yeah. how a progressive dispensationalism was influenced by the European scholarship? And I got what? my PhD over in Wales, and I came back still a dispensationalist, but yeah. that was life. And that's, very, that's a very common story. Let, let, me, let me reiterate, the, the purpose of the book is not polemical. So we're not fighting for one expression of dispensationalism. Yeah, Although... No, but I'm asking, did you interact with how that evolved in yes. the progression of dispensationalism? Yes, of course. So the middle section of the book deals with all dispensationalism going through Europe and its European expressions. And through that, you're going to get all the, you know, where the, 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 the ideas first germinated in Europe. And... Specifically, in more modern expressions, it was brought up, C.H. Dodd, British expositor, uh, Oscar Coleman. Yeah. That is where George Ladd, George Ladd is known in Amer North America as, who kind of founded, inaugurated eschatology, but those ideas get traced back to Dodd and Coleman, in particular with realized eschatology and the already not yet there, until Dodd, Dodd uh, uh, formulated here, but those do come up in the book. But um, Bach's chapter, he revised his very influential article from Jets, Journal of Evangelical Theological Society, Why I'm a Dispensationalist with a Little D. Yes. If you go back to that article, that's pretty much the chapter other than the last portion of the chapter he's revised and brought to date. He hasn't changed his positions on things. So, but he didn't, uh, I guess I hadn't read the book because he hadn't out, so uh, he, didn't, he didn't speak about how the influence of Europe on his thoughts in the chapter, in his chapter, not that I can recall. Not, it, there might be some in there, but it, it's been a little while since I've read his chapter. But I used God in some of my work. Uh, you know, I'm a late bloomer. You know, in 2015, you know, I got my yeah. uh, dissertation over there, and you know, you can use those guys, but you've got to critique them. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last part. You have to critique. Critique them, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I even use Hayes, but you know, uh, you got to watch. All, all these guys. Right. Yeah, this is, um, our book, Forged from Reformation, is, it is historical, there's no doubt about it. This is one that we published in 2017. But it is more polemical than this one. Again, this one is historically descriptive. I, I'll be honest with you guys, I am a traditional dispensationalist, but I, I run within generally Southern Baptist circles in the PhD at Midwestern Baptist Seminary, and I can, I can tell you, the fastest growing, now the largest Southern Baptist Seminary, which is Midwestern, uh, these ideas, are historically not considered at all. 
I mean, I, uh, from very, very bright doctoral students to the chief of staff at the seminary, I'm having personal conversations with them and straight to my face without, and without, without trying to be offensive, but really out of ignorance has said, well, didn't Schofield, I thought Schofield invented dispensationalism. And he was being totally serious. And this is the, 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 the top brass at the seminary, if you will. Um, that's the idea, that's the thought that's being, uh, that's promulgated in our younger crop of scholars, especially within the SBC. And so us doing this book was really to trace historically, um, descriptively, how these ideas emerge so it can be accepted. You know, whether you have issues with that, whatever, I think it's a good thing to be accepted in the scholarly discussion where we're generally not represented. You know, so at ETS, SBL, which, forgive me, I'm a member of as well, and present papers, and we want to be a voice for conservative academic scholarship in places we normally aren't represented. Yeah, the Presbyterianism, it was the main denomination through which uh, dispensationalism developed. And they probably have the greatest scholarly tradition of any denomination in the United States. And uh, there's a doctoral dissertation by a guy named Rudolph Renfer at the University of Texas in Austin on the history of Dallas Seminary. And he shows that before World War II, 80% of Dallas grads went into the Presbyterian Church. And they had that famous trial uh, in the late 30s and everything, five-year investigation as to whether or not dispensationalists c comported with the Westminster Confession. And that's, by the way, why Chafer quotes the Westminster Confession in his systematic theology more than any other uh, source. And uh, they didn't say it did, they didn't say it didn't. They kind of took a middle position, but it had the effect of forcing dispensationalists out of the Southern Presbyterian Church and the Northern as well. And so they ended up starting something known as Bible churches. And, uh, independent churches and all the early faculty at Dallas were uh, Presbyterians and many of them were Princeton grads and when Princeton went liberal in 1929 uh, Dallas you had you know seminaries had a hundred people back then and you had two New Testament guys two Old Testament guys two theology guys you know what I'm saying well Dallas got uh, the E.F. Harrison, who was Machen's other Greek New Testament professor, he taught at Dallas for 17 years, and then he went to Fuller because Dallas did not pay much back in those days, <laughs> and he had a large family. And you got, uh, goodness, what was the other guy who was Robert Dick Wilson, that very famous Hebrew scholar. Daniel And uh, the his understudy was... Uh, Goodness, for some reason I can't think of the guy's name. He came and taught one year at Dallas, and then he founded Faith Theological Seminary. And people like Dwight Pentecost, for example, uh, you know, Presbyterian from the Philadelphia area, he was supposed to go to that new seminary, Faith Theological Seminary, uh, and he got out of college a year early, so he came to Dallas and never looked back, I guess. But you, you have all of these guys coming out of the Reformed Calvinist uh, background and yeah. probably in the 60s and se 70s you begin to see a, a, sh a shift you know away from a lot of that stuff but all of, even Lisbeth Chafer's brother was a graduate of Princeton well that's why it was Tommy your work in particular one your chapter you did in Forge from Reformation but also this one is very very important that you know bringing to light that uh, dispensationalists were, were reformed guys that came out of a, a Presbyterian tradition and, and more Calvinistic understanding of things because that in the, in the again the scholarly w world that I interact with of non-dispensationalists they, they are completely ignorant to that uh, for example that's why I started off with those quotes from Facebook the one was Presbyterians were never historically dispensationalists or something like that you know, they were then, just like they are now, well-educated. The implication is we're stupid, which is why they wouldn't be, you know, dispensationalists. But, like, your chapter in this particular book and the, our previous one um, definitely should settle the matter. It puts it to rest that, no, as you mentioned, I mean, Lewis, uh, Lewis Berry Chair, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think he was even defrocked from Presbyterianism or so because, he, because of the stance of the Westminster Convention. Yeah, he never was, but uh, because of that 
moderate position. But he, he used to say, I was told, that uh, if I'm defrocked, I'll go and join the brethren or something like that uh, and, th and things like that. But uh, we, dispensationalism was viewed and has been viewed, if you're a dis you could have five earned PhDs, but you're not a scholar if you're a dispensationalist. See what I'm saying? That's the attitude that they had. And I think my generation, Daryl Bach and those guys, wanted to be scholars. And I think that was the biggest factor in the shift. And so, like a modern person, they redefine things. And uh, they, they come up with the redefinition of dispensationalism as if it had gone through all these changes over the years. Now, there have been some changes, but as Ryrie points out, uh, you know, there are developments within the system, and then there are changes that change the system. And of course, he believed progressive dispensationalism destroyed dispensationalism because it did not make a distinction between Israel and the church, which is one of the, that is the key theological factor that makes you a dispensationalist, is seeing those programs. Did you have something? Uh, if this is a little bit off topic, uh, forgive me, and I can catch up with you later. But near you, Escondido, uh, Westminster, West Coast, uh, there is a debate about two kingdom theology going on now right between Michael Horton and John Frame, who's reacting to the change. Meredith Klein, that's referenced heavily in uh, Chafee's book, uh, Fallen, uh, is part of that faculty there. And um, I'm wondering if you're aware of because I am not, but I, I'm trying to make the connection between what's going on there, being that's a reformed seminary and is heavily uh, our critics. Uh, is there a connection between what's developing there and what's going on on the uh, typical reformed faith attacks on predispensational theology? Yeah, I, I couldn't speak too much on the, the intricacies of that debate. There certainly is. There's been some rivalry between uh, Westminster Seminary, California, and Escondido, and Westminster in, in, in Pennsylvania for a while. Uh, it started with, at least that I know, it started with the idea of the covenant of works, their specific covenant. Is that a, is that a, a recitation of the Mosaic Law, or is that something completely new that was that was that was new or, or uh, originated go, go in the you. garden? And from there, it developed into these other ideas of, of kingdom. So I just, I, all I can say is that it's, it, it gets traced to that idea of the differences between their theological covenants and it got fleshed out in their kingdom views. Couldn't say much more on that, other than they're wrong. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate, you. It, appreciate it, Corey.